right, so last week we discussed um, where, hi Lena, um, last week we discussed that, um, you know, we got, we only did like a couple verses where Jesus had just the lady in the well, remember the lady at the well, she had just left the well, she was so excited that uh, she had met the Messiah, the one who told her everything about herself, she couldn't wait to get back to the village, she laid down the shame. She laid down that Proverbs 7. She just wanted to go and tell people about the Jesus that she just encountered. She even left her water pot. You know, that's such a beautiful story of redemption, such a beautiful story of how God does choose the least of these. He chooses, you know, those that come out of such sin and such bondage, you know, that he went to the Samaritan woman and, and chose her at the well. And it was just such a beautiful story. And then we went into where the, where the disciples came back with the food that they had went and, and got for him. And so we'll just kind of start there at verse 32 again. But he said to them, I have food to eat in which you do not know. And he wasn't being like, oh, look at me, I'm self-righteous. I don't need food to survive. He was just saying, he, remember, Jesus use, loves to use analogies. He, he loves to use, if he's talking to the woman at the well, then he's going to use an analogy about the living water, being the living water. He loves to use earthly things for spiritual meaning. Um, and so he's doing that with the food here. 33, therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus was here to be our redeemer, to finish the work of Jesus, or to finish the work of the gospel, the redemptive work of the gospel for the cross, to take our sin, to save the world. And that's what his food was. That's what he, where he was drawing his energy from. We know that he was exhausted because it, remember it said how exhausted he was when he reached the well. And so you know he was physically exhausted, but yet preaching the gospel, doing the Lord's work should give us a supernatural energy and a supernatural, just this, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I just get really energized when I'm walking in my gifts and my callings. Um, but then I also kind of switched it when it says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And I had said, my food is to do the will of Christ who saved me and to finish his work. I'm here to finish the work that Jesus Christ has saved me to do. He has a calling and a giftings for each and every one of you. He has things that you're to be, that you are to complete while you're here on this earth. Every single person, he's chose each and every one of us. He's given each and every one of us gifts and talents. And so we should be walking in those gifts, walking in that calling, pursuing that because he saved us for that. To, and that should be our desire to do his work, just like it was his to do the will of the Father. And then remember last week we got together, we talked about what were some of the things that were the will of God. And we went to some of the things that said God's will really talked about the crucifying of the flesh, walking in holiness, walking in righteousness, walking as ambassadors to, for Jesus Christ. We would really discussed that in depth. And so now we're going to come into the next part of this. And it says in 35, do you not say that there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they're already white with harvest. So in on the earth, it was about four more months, and that's when the harvest would have been ready. And he's saying, so in four months, this harvest isn't ready. But he's saying, look up now, because the harvest is ready now. He says, and he who, and, and so he's talking about, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white with harvest. Now, he didn't do something supernatural here on the earth where he suddenly just made the harvest ready physically to go and be picked. He's talking about the village. The woman at the well went and told the villagers about the Messiah, about this man who told about everything she knew, everything about her, all of her sin. And she was so excited. And so when he tells the disciples to look up and see the harvest, see it's white for harvest, they would have been in white robes because that's what they wore in Samaria. And so they would have looked up and saw all these men from a village coming towards them in these white robes. And so he's speaking of the spiritual harvest that's coming towards them right now. And so you can kind of picture him and the disciples standing there and all these men from the village coming to, to learn about the Messiah, to learn who's this guy. Is it really him? Could it really be the savior of the world? We're going to go check it out. So you see that passion and that excitement. And so verse 36, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For this is the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. This is such a beautiful spiritual blessing. Don't give up on preaching the gospel to the lost. 
I know I've had some of you say, man, it sometimes just feels fruitless. Like I just, I preach the gospel. I preach the gospel. Nobody's listening. They don't want it. They're not hearing me. And you, but this is what Jesus is saying here. You're sowing, but there might be somebody who comes along. You don't know when, a year from now, five years, 10 years, and they're going to reap. You've said the gospel. You planted all these seeds. And then, some, and then somebody else can come on and water that, but God gives the increase. He saves. And you're both going to receive the same reward. And you may not know till you get to heaven. You'll be standing there, and there'll be all these people that are standing there that got saved through, through you preaching the gospel, even though you weren't technically the one that got to stand there the day that they got regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And you're going to receive the same reward. You know, and also know that there's going to be many people that you're preaching the gospel to that grandma's been praying for for 20, 30, 40 years, or mom's been praying for, or other people have been preaching the gospel. And then all of a sudden you come along and boom, God saves them and you get to be a part of that, but yet you didn't labor for it. You didn't spend 20 years in prayer. You didn't spend 20 years, you know, preaching the gospel to that one person, but you still get to reap even though you only spent five minutes with them. But you guys get the same. You guys, we're, we're a team. And that's what Jesus is saying here. We're a team. We're doing this together. Don't be jealous of one another. Don't compete with one another. But just know we're all here for the same purpose. Amen. To represent Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world through love and the good news of the gospel. And we're all, we're all in this together. So who cares who's sowing and who's reaping? We all get the same reward. It's about soul winning. It's about getting people reconciled back to their father. Back to the creator. And so 37. For in this the saying is true. One sows another reaps. 38. I set you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others had labored and you entered into their labors. The woman actually went and labored. Jesus labored, paid it all at the cross. But we get to enter into someone else's labors. And someone else is going to enter into your labors. We just keep preaching the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel. Just keep throwing the seed out there. We don't know who God's saving. Keep throwing the seed out there. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. That's what I'm trying to say to some of you today. Because I know i got some serious evangelists in this room. And you guys evangelize day and night. And sometimes it's really discouraging. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Some of you evangelists in here, you get it. I mean, I evangelize. But I'm not like you. Some of you are like evangelists. Like day and night pounding the pavement. You know what I mean? And it can get discouraging. Like, ah, oh, sometimes I just, did anybody want this? I've got like this cure for their disease and it's almost like, how do you not want this? You know, but don't give up. Continue just throwing the seed out there. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. How awesome just to sit there and listen to Jesus for two days and many more believed because of his word. He just told them about who he was. He would have given them the kingdom of God. He would have told them about the Father. He would have given them kingdom principles. And they believed. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This is just becoming very personal. They spent personal time with Jesus and they believe now. And I find this very interesting that the first time and the only he has declared the savior of the world is again by the Samaritans, by the half-breeds, the Jew and Gentile mixed breeds, not Jerusalem, not Israel, not the righteous leaders, not the Pharisees. They can't see that he's the savior of the world. Religion can't see it. They can't see Jesus for who he is. They're blinded by their religion and their pride and their vanity. But the Gentiles saw it. And not only did they see it, but they realized he was the savior of the world. They got it. They declared it. He's here for everybody. Not just one sect of people. Not just the Jewish people. It says now, verse 43, Now after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee. Verse 44, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Jesus is getting ready to go back to Galilee. It's about nine... Not about, I think we thought, nine miles away from when he did the, in Canaan, when he did the, when he changed the water into wine. So he's going back into a region where people know who he is. He's going back to that place where he turned the water into wine. They all would have known about the miracle. He's going back into this place and he's saying, there's no honor 
for me there. A prophet has no honor in his own land. And we know that this has been said before, but we also know how hard it is to minister even to our own family. You know, they have pamper butt syndrome. You know, I pampered your butt at one time. Who are you to tell me about Jesus? You know, um, friends that may have known us in the past. Sometimes it's just really hard to profit and pro be a prophet in your own land or be a prophet in your own home. Sometimes it's hard. Your kids kind of hear it over and over again from you. And so we pray for someone else to come along and start sowing into what you've been sowing into and hopefully that they reap that harvest that we've been laboring into. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm getting ready to go back to this place where, man, they have, there's no honor for me there. They don't honor me. They don't see me. I die. I'm, I'm getting ready to die for them. I've been, I've been prophesied for them for 2000 years, all these years. And yet, you know, they still don't, they still don't see it. Verse 45, so when he came to Galilee and the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast, they, they knew about Jesus. There was so much buzz about Jesus Christ. He was, what they saw is a miracle man. They knew his miracles were never denied. You guys, never, never was, never do you see his miracles denied by the Pharisees or anybody in the New Testament, nor any historical writings that we have None of no miracles have ever been denied. There was definitely something about this man named Jesus who came on this earth and performed miracles. No one denied that he didn't do miracles. They may deny that he's God, they may deny that he's the Messiah, they may deny who he is, but they did not deny his miracles. And so a crowd is already gathering because they know that he's back in town, the guy that turned the water into wine, and they would have heard all about his miracles. So Jesus came again to Canaan of Galilee where he had made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick in Capernaum. So let me kind of explain to you who this nobleman is. That nobleman is actually, um, it, it's a basilica would be the word, but he actually would have been a servant of the king. And so the king, the only king in that region at this time would have been Herod of Anthipasus. Now Herod of Anthipasus would have been the son of Herod the Great who murdered all the babies. In Bethlehem remember when Jesus murder all of the ones from very evil man very evil evil man and now this is his son now his son is the one who killed John the Baptist he's the one that beheaded him his head's on the platter because the king was so pleased with the daughter who danced and then he said what can I give you I want to pay you in return so then she asks her mother what should we what should i ask for and she doesn't think to ask for you know a hundred thousand dollars or whatever she says give me john the baptist's head on a platter and so they beheaded him so this is that king okay this is that guy very evil very corrupt king but this is his servant he would have worked in, he would have been in the kingdom um working as a servant in the in this man's kingdom and so but yet he hears about jesus he's got a very sick boy um, it's likely that he lived in Tiberias, which is where the kingdom was. He probably would have walked his son over to Capernaum, but then the son was likely too sick. So he probably wouldn't want to take him over to Canaan. It would have been about a 15, 20 mile walk. So he probably left his son in Capernaum. And then he walks over to Cana because he hear, or Galilee, because he hears that there's a miracle man. Listen, his son's sick. He don't care who the miracle man is. He don't care if he's God, Jesus, worshiping pagan gods, if it's Satan himself. He don't care. He just wants his son healed. And we're going to get into that in a second. It says, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son. And he was at the point of death. You see the desperation of this father. I don't care who it is. I just want my son healed. We can get so earthly minded. So earthly minded on things. Of course, we want, we don't want to see our children suffer. Of course, we would love to see. I would have loved to have seen my dad healed of cancer and still be with me today. Of course, but I I wouldn't have just I wouldn't have let Satan do it. I wouldn't have sold my soul for it. There's nothing on earth that you could have given me that I would said, okay, heal my dad and I'll do this if it's against God. No way. But he doesn't care. He just wants his son healed, and this is what Jesus says. Remember, he knows the heart of all men. And, let, and Jesus says, then Jesus said to him, now mind you, there's a big crowd around Jesus at this point. Jesus always had a big crowd around him. He was a miracle man. 
and they want to see the miracle man. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now, when he uses this word you, it is a plural word in the Greek. So he's saying you, nobleman, and you, crowd. Unless you guys see signs and wonders, you don't want to believe. He's rebuking them. Uh, yeah, praise God. He does do signs, wonders, and miracles. But that is not all he is. That is not just who he is. These people were there for what he had to offer, offer them on this earth. They wanted to be blessed. They wanted The Jews wanted the king. They wanted him to overthrow Rome and become the king of the Jews. The people around him just wanted their demons cast out. They just wanted to be healed. They wanted to be blessed by this miracle man. That's all they wanted. They didn't want God. They didn't want holiness. They didn't want righteousness. They didn't want to have to repent of their sins. They just wanted the signs, wonders, and miracles. Can I, can I get a witness on, on Christianism that's moving that way now? We have an entire signs, wonders, and movement in Christianism that has, is, is impacting the globe right now. Where there's, That's what they're following. They don't preach the word. They pluck it out of context to, to preach a different gospel. The word of faith movement and the NAR. They're both very dangerous at this point. They follow after signs, wonders, and miracles. They're following after the miracle man. What can you give me? I don't want to change for you, but what can you give me? I just want the gold dust. I just want the health, wealth, prosperity. I just want to be, have my best life now. And if that just means professing Christ and showing up to church on Sunday, so be it. But let me tell you something. When life gets hard, their whole theology crashes around them. And because they've been serving a false Jesus, then they blame God. They get mad at God because their promises of their miracle man isn't there for them because they've been worshiping a different God. They've been worshiping a God made up in their own mind. And how do we get deceived by these doctrines of devils? We're not in the word ourselves. We're not reading the Bible for ourselves. We're following after false teachers and false prophets and false ministries that make it look really good on television and really good on YouTube and make out really good articles, but we're not researching it ourselves. Whenever you guys give me an article or you guys give me a, a thing and you'll say, can you watch this or you, can you tell me about what do you think of this teaching? Or what? I don't even watch the teaching. You know what I do? I look who's the name and I go and research that person. I don't care what the teaching is because every false teacher has truth within its lies. That's how they catch you. Every false ministry has truth within their lies. That's how they keep you. I want to know, you want to know what I want to know? What do you, who do you say Jesus is? That's what I want to know. Who do you say Jesus is? So I go and I research it. And if I can't find it, there's a problem. Because that should be the first thing on your website is who do you say Jesus is? It should point to Christ and him crucified. That's the first thing I want people to know about BTC is who do we say Jesus is? And so that's what I'm researching because that's going to tell me right then and there. I don't care how much truth you have in there. If you don't even know who the right Jesus is, you're not biblically accurate on who God is, who Jesus is. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want you speaking into my life. I don't care if that video is really good or that article sounds good. And I encourage you guys to do the same thing. Know who you're following. Know who you're letting speak into your life and you're letting teach you. Because we have a, I, mean, I, I think we have more false teachers and more wolves out there now than we have true teachers. We are in the apostate yeah. times. We are in the end days. And it's everywhere. And social media has only exploded it and expounded on it. Satan has done a great job using social media as a tool to deceive you. Man, guys, you, can, you, you don't like what the Bible says. I can find a false teacher for you that will tickle your ears and tell you your sin is fine. You can do this. You can do that. You can live this way. This is the truth. Oh, we, you know, be careful with the new truths. Well, we just discovered in archaeology, we just, when we, we found out that this actually wasn't like that in the Hebrew back then. Listen, guys, we have a beautiful, rich church history. It's not taught anymore. It's rarely studied out. But we have a beautiful, beautiful church history that is so amazing if you study it out. And there's a, re there's a consistency of God is consistent, okay? And so somebody comes to you with this new truth, this new revelation, this, well, this actually means this in the Hebrew. This actually means this in the Greek. And they got all these new... Just be careful. Really research it. Know your church history. Know your Bible. 
but take the time to search church history. Know, know where a lot of this stuff comes, know why we believe in the Trinity, because there's a lot of false teachers out there that'll tell you that it's a Catholic thing. Well, it's the Catholics. The Catholics started that. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. And, and when you study it, you realize, no, they always believed that. The early church always believed it, and it actually comes from a guy in the 100s. 100, right after Jesus, right after the, the second generation after the apostles died. Catholicism didn't start for hundreds and hundreds of years later. But you don't know that. And, but that video will convince you, but unless you go and search it out. So, he's not just a miracle man. That is an awesome thing. Our God does have signs, wonders, and miracles. He does still heal today. I firmly believe that. But that's not why we worship him. That's not why we serve him. And, I mean, I, I, I've talked to somebody recently that, you know, things are happening in their life. You know, they're not, God's not doing for them what they feel that he should do. And they're mad at God. And they're mad at God. You know? Well, he said he'd never leave me and forsake me, but he has. Oh, so God's a liar? God's a liar because you're not getting what you want. What gospel did you buy into? Because the gospel I read says I could potentially lose everything in order to follow him because he's worth it. Gospel that I read about says, the cro pick up my cross every day, die to my flesh every day, die to myself and my earthly desires every day. And to stay heavenly minded, not earthly minded. That's the gospel I read in the scriptures. So he's saying here, man, by no means you guys will believe. And the, the noble man says to him, sir, come down before my child dies. He's desperate. He's pleading, but he's, he's respecting the miracle man. And he uses the word sir. And he respects him, but man, he's still staying focused on this. I really just need you to heal my son. And Jesus said to him, go, go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went his way. So the man believed, the miracle man. We know that he turned water into wine. He's, he knows that he's a miracle man. So he believed him. He believed that he healed his son. So he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Now, I thought this was interesting. The, the father didn't immediately go home. He clearly stayed the night in Caperna. He's really in Cana because it's only a 15 to 20 mile walk. And had he had left Jesus... And, he would have went immediately home. He had already been home. This is the next day, as we're going to read. He's just, so he stays the night there. So he obviously had a peace in his heart that the miracle man healed his son because he didn't go running home. And how do we know this? Because he's on his way now to Capernaum, and it's the next day. And he was now going down, and his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. And then he inquired of them in the hour which he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him seventh hour would have been we think about 1 p.m so the father knew that it was the same hour in which jesus said to him your son lives and he himself believed now we're talking about a saving faith now he doesn't just believe in the miracle mind now he believes in the messiah now he knows that Jesus is Lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he came to save the world. Some commentaries, some theologians think that he was a Jewish nobleman working for um, the king. Could be, possibility. So he would have heard about the Messiah. He also could have been a Gentile. It really doesn't matter. The point is, he got saved. And not just him and his whole household. So he immediately starts preaching the gospel to his whole household. His wife got saved, his kids, the servants would have gotten saved. He starts preaching to all of them, and they all got saved. They no longer just have a faith in a miracle man, but now they have a faith in God himself, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. And see, I want you guys to remember in chapter 2, remember verse 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem... In Salem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when he saw this when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So you can have a belief in Jesus that's not a saving faith. These people believed in the miracle man. No one denied he was a miracle man. But then there's a saving faith. 
There's a belief in his name and who he is as, his, as the Messiah, the Savior, God, Almighty, the one who died for your sins on the cross, the one who was buried and resurrected three days later and is coming back for a bride without spot and blemish, a God who says, be holy for I am holy. See, we can have a belief in a religion. We can have a belief in a, in a, the name Jesus. Maybe grandma took you to church all your life and you just always believed. And, and then you had kid, you kind of left the church and went and lived your life. And now you got a little older and you got married and had some kids. And now you think, ah, oh, might as well take the kids back to church. I mean, it was a good way for me to grow up. You can have a belief that doesn't save But this guy got saved in his whole household too. And this again is the second sign Jesus did when he came out of Judea in Galilee. His first sign would have been turning the water into wine. Remember the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not a fear of anxiety or depression or it's a reverential fear. No Paul says, examine yourselves and know that you're in the faith. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't ever mess up. That's not what we're talking about here. But if we live a life of habitual sin, we live a life that's contrary to the cross. We, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Examine yourselves. Work out your, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I still question my own salvation at times. Just... And I examine myself. I don't want to get there on judgment day and say how I've cast out demons and prophesied and did healings and had BTC. And, do, and he says, Amy, I never knew you. You know, I truly examine my own heart so that I know that I'm in the faith. I know that I'm regenerated. I know that I'm not under some strong delusion because I've been there. I've been there. It's easy to do, especially today with all the false teaching. This is where we need to stay right here. This is your parameter. This is your boundary. This, by the Holy Spirit of God, teaching you his word. Stay here. This is our safety. This is what will keep us from being knocked from every wind of doctrine and unstable in all our ways. This will what, what will keep us from being deceived by false teachers and false teachings is by taking everything back to the word in context and knowing our word. Have a believing faith, saving faith, not just believe in the miracle man. Be really careful with those movements. They're all spirit, but I'm telling you, Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist spirit's already here. Lying signs and wonders, guys. There's a lot of that going on. He's already here. He's already here. So, you know, test every spirit. Take everything to the word of God. Don't let experiences trump the word of God. The word of God trumps our experiences. Satan's more than happy to give you an experience. Satan is giving all kinds of false experiences inside the church to keep you deceived. When I say you, I don't mean you personally. I'm saying us as a whole, people. Do you understand? Know that you believe in the Jesus of the scripture. Know that you know this gospel. There's only one gospel that says, Paul says, if I or even an angel come to you and preach a different gospel, I will let us be accursed. There's different gospels out there, but there's only one saving gospel. And that's it. I can't go into chapter 5 because it's a long story about the pool of Bethsaida where the lame man's going to get healed, so we're going to really spend some time on that next week.